you know, I just feel uh, I just feel impressed to say something this morning to begin with to those who have lost loved ones, especially recently. I see my cousin Dario is on and she lost her mother not too long ago. And, uh, and our brother Lloyd lost his wife just a couple of weeks ago. And it's just recently that I have, I have come to understand what death really feels like. I never lost anyone that was valuable to me until fairly recently. When you lose someone that you love, it is a devastating and heartbreaking experience. And only those who have had the experience can really understand what it is like. But, you know, I find it interesting that even though we look at death in this way, and it's natural for us as humans to do so, Jesus looks at it from a completely different perspective. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, Jesus says something which might sound shocking to some people. He says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. What an unusual word to use when you're talking about dead people. But he says, those who die in the Lord, they are blessed. They have a special privilege and a special favor. It's interesting that Jesus looks at it that way. And, and, and why does he look at it? From this perspective, he says that they may have rest from their labor. All of our loved ones who are sleeping now, Brother Ken, they no longer have the pain and the darkness and the depression of this world to deal with. In fact, they will never ever have to deal with that again for the rest of eternity. Their fight is over. It is finished. And in addition to that, he says, their works follow them. In other words, there's a record kept of what they did but I'm, I'm 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 suggesting to you that there's one thing in particular that they did which matters and that is that they chose him that is all the record in heaven shows that all of them who are sleeping they chose him it doesn't matter that they weren't perfect it doesn't matter that there were flaws in their characters it doesn't matter that they were at times very weak what is important is that they chose him all he needed was a foothold and they gave that to him. And as they like to say, the rest is history. Their destiny is secure and sealed. And so Jesus says they are blessed. I like to look at it from the perspective that what they have done is taken a shortcut to glory. The next time they open their eyes, they will see in the clouds the glory of the ages that the creation has waited 6,000 years to see. And they will know that it is over. It's all over. As a child, I, I mentioned this on here before. As a child, I used to read fairy tales. And all of them ended, and they lived happily ever after. And as you grow up into an adult, you understand and you realize that there's no such thing on this planet as happily ever after. Everything always ends ultimately in disaster. But for the sons of God, you know what? Happily ever after is not a fairy tale. In fact, the last book of the Bible ends by saying that there will be no more debt. There will be no more pain. We will live happily ever after. For the Christian, happily ever after is not a fairy tale. So take heart. We miss them, but their salvation is secured. Soon it will be glory forever for those who sleep. But I just want to add that to those people in particular. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as I invite the Lord's presence. As we share from your words this morning, Father, I ask that you will speak to our hearts. I ask that you will open our minds to hear what you have to say to us. And that as always, we will be, we will be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to entitle my presentation this morning. The work of God. I want to begin by pointing out that the hallmark 
of all false religion. If I were to if I were to summarize it in one word, the word I would use is labor. All false religion emphasizes hard work. Every one of them that I have investigated, the principle is that if you want to earn favor from God, you have to work for it. You have to toil to get it. Go and do a research of religions around the world and you will see what I'm talking about. I've given some of those examples online here already, but I'll mention them again. Judaism has 613 laws that the followers have to observe and every one of them if you break any of them it's considered a grave sin they have laws ranging from how far you can walk on the sabbath day to how much you have to pay tide how much tide you have to pay when you pick a piece of mint right so if they go outside and pick a piece of mint bush what they do is count the leaves and then the amount of leaves will determine how many of them you have to pluck off to pay tithe. Very meticulous, hard labor. Hinduism is the same thing. Hindus teach that you have to teach yourself to think the right thoughts, do the right actions, have the right attitude. You have to teach these things to yourself. And you can do this through hours and hours of yoga and meditation each day. And while you're meditating, you're chanting to yourself, I must think right thoughts, I must think right thoughts, I must think right thoughts. And by consistently repeating these mantras, you can mentally and cognitively recondition your own mind to become better. And as you become better, God becomes more pleased. But, but, but it is not possible to accomplish this in one lifetime. Depending on how well you do in this lifetime, it might take you several hundred lifetimes to accomplish a level where you are good enough for God to say, all right, now I'll give you a chance. Several hundred lifetimes of working and toiling to please God and to earn his favor. Islam is probably even worse. Islam, is, it, I, 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 I'm trying to determine whether Islam is more oppressive or judaism muslims have laws that govern how you not to be too graphic they have laws that govern how you defecate right when a muslim is going to the bathroom first of all he has to say a prayer at the door of the bathroom he has to enter the bathroom with his left foot before he starts what he's, he has gone in there to do he has to say another prayer then when he starts, he has to say a prayer for that. When he's finished, he has to cleanse himself with his left hand. And then he has to say a prayer when he's finished. He has to leave the bathroom with his right foot. And then there's a separate prayer for that. Just to use the bathroom, there are five or six different prayers. And if you miss any of these steps, God is upset. He's displeased with you. They have laws for how you walk. Let me just read a sentence explaining to you what the law, what the, what the, the, the law of Islam is as, as it relates to how you walk. It says, when you are walking, you should reflect and take note of the wonders of Allah's work wherever you go. Do not be mocking or strut or walk too fast or walk too slow. Lower your gaze. Don't look too arrogant. And don't look at anything that is inappropriate. And think about Allah while you walk. So they, 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 they go as far as to tell you what you should be thinking while you walk. And if you fail at any of these steps, God is displeased. They have laws for how you sleep. Let's do what it says again. It says, when Muhammad laid down to sleep, he would go on his right side. And he would place his right hand under his right cheek. Sleeping on your stomach is not permitted because this is the way that Shetan, that Satan, sleeps. Women must sleep on the left side of the bed and lying or sleeping on her stomach is disliked by Allah. Man, talk about hard labor. This is hard labor. 
And the thing about it is that if you fail at any of these things, how you walk, how you use the bathroom, how you sleep, God is displeased. I was reading it and I found it quite kind of amusing at, in, in, in some cases, but it's also sad because people genuinely believe that this is the way to salvation. I want to point out to you that in many ways, Christianity is not much better. You go from denomination to denomination and you look at the things that are taught. You have to work. You, can, you should do this. You should not do that. You should do this. You should not do that. It's work. And, you know, the worst one is probably Catholicism. Catholics go as far as to flagellate themselves when they are praying. For those who don't know what that means, they believe that if you pray to God and you are not getting the answer you seek, you must cause physical pain to yourself. A lot of them will take knives and cut themselves, or they will use whips and beat themselves while they pray to the point where it draws blood. And they believe that when God looks and sees that you are willing to go that far to cause physical pain to yourself, then God is pleased and he will say, okay, since you are willing to go that far, I will give you what you're asking for. A terrible, false misconception of God. But it's all labor and working. Even as a health reformer, growing up, I used to believe that labor is what God required. There was a time when I believed that eating cheese and eating meat were sins. It was a time when I believed that if I had any thought enter my mind other than religious thoughts on a Sabbath, I was committing a grave sin. I used to believe that if a woman put any kind of processing in her hair whatsoever, or if she put on a piece of jewelry, she was committing a great sin. I know who, people who went as far as to believe that even if you are married, you should not wear a, a wedding ring. I, it was legalism of the highest order. And the basis and principle of it is that if you want to please God, you have to earn his pleasure. It's, it's something that is innate in human nature, right? Normally, the, the way we, 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 have, we have been socialized is that if you want something from another person, you can't just get it like that. You have to do something in return for that person. The whole society is set up like that. You want something, you have to give something in return. And the extent of what you give must be equivalent to the extent of how great the thing is that you want. And from the dawn of time, from the inception of the earliest religion, man has had the same concept of God. In fact, there was a time that God himself set up such a system. A large portion of those 613 laws that the Jews have even today were given by God. A rigid system, rivaled, as I said, only by Islam. But... You know, it's a system that never worked, and God knew that it would never work. But the Jews tried. They really tried. And for 4,000 years, labor did not work. With all of the laws they had, their religion was as dry as the hills of Gilboa. 613 laws and they still felt dissatisfied and this was the condition of some men who came to jesus in john chapter 6 starting from verse 28 this was their condition they were keeping all the laws and yet somehow they realized that there was something missing still we are not reaching the mark we are working on toiling endlessly and it's not making a difference and so they come to Jesus, and this is the question that they ask. Then said they unto him, what shall we do? The word do tells you what the frame of mind was. What other action can we perform that we might work the works of God? 613 laws, and it's not enough. We still don't feel like we're a accomplishing what we want something is still missing 
I suppose they expected Jesus to say, well, you are doing well with the 613, but there are 10 more that you are, you are missing, and I'm going to tell you what they are. They expected to hear some more rules and regulations. The answer that Jesus gives them is an answer that echoes through the annals of time. An answer that gives hope to all of humanity. It is the answer that gives peace and rest to all of our souls this morning. Jesus says in verse 29, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. What a shocking answer. He never said you need to go to church earlier. He never said you need to start wearing your clothes a little longer. He never said you need to start doing this or that. He never told them any work that they should do, which is what they were expecting. The work of God is that you do something. You believe. And if you believe, the work is done. Wow, that's amazing. This is what puts light years between false religion and the truth of God. False religion says God is sitting in heaven and he's looking down on earth and he is aloof and detached. And if you can work hard enough and, and make enough effort to impress him and get his attention, then maybe he'll give you a chance. But the onus is on you. You are the one who has to make it happen. And those who try hardest of all will get the greatest um, reward of all. That's what false religion says. The truth says, God looked at man and he knew that we were hopeless. He knew that there was nothing that any of us could do to earn one favor from him, to be worthy of anything from him. He knew we were helpless. And so you know what he did? He took heaven's greatest treasures, heaven's greatest blessings and gifts, and all the great and wonderful things that heaven ever had to offer. And you know what he did? He put them in one person and gave him to us as a gift. And he says, all you need to do is associate yourself with him and your labor is done he does everything else man look at false religion and look at that aren't you glad you chose jesus no amount of labor could ever make any of us worthy enough to win god's favor and so he gives us one work believe on him whom he has sent. If there's anybody here this morning who believes on Jesus Christ, you know what? I congratulate you because you are doing the work of God. Don't worry about how you use the bathroom or how you sleep or how you walk or how you eat or how much time you pay from mint or any of those. Don't worry about any of those things. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you are doing the work of God. That is what he says. And I'm glad I chose him. I don't know about you. I want to point out that there are two, I would say that there are two phases to this concept of believing. Believing, first of all, refers to the heathen and the pagans and the ungodly who don't know Jesus. And they come to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is the Son of God and he's the only way to salvation. And they accept that. That is phase one of believing. But there's, in fact, that level is where the thief on the cross came to. He never passed that. But that was enough. That was enough. There are many people who have gone to their graves never knowing the truth about the Godhead. But they came to phase one, and that was enough. There are many who went to their graves not knowing the truth about the Sabbath or about eternally burning hell or any of these things. But they came to phase one, and that, I believe with all my heart, was enough. It was enough, 
and they will see him on resurrection day. But those of us who are here this morning, I believe that there's a phase two, and I believe we are going through it now. And I'll tell you what it is. In fact, Jesus says himself what it is in John chapter 15 and verse 4. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. It's a verse we can all quote in our sleeps, right? So step one is believing in Jesus. And step two is to know walk and exist in that belief. If you are doing this, as I said before, you are doing the work of God. I don't know if Brother Joel is on as yet, but I'm going to preempt him. And I'm going to preempt the question that I know he might ask me at the end. And I'm going to point out to you from the beginning that abiding is a process. Abiding is a process. There are several aspects and several things that are involved in this process that we as children of God have to grow into and learn and develop, right? As we abide, we come to understand the nuances of what this means. We come to understand the dangers of letting him go. As a Christian, there are many times in my walk that I have taken my eyes off Christ. And I've fallen into dangerous situations. And I'm sure all of us can say the same thing. But you know what has happened? As time has passed, and I've had these experiences, and I've come back to him. Sometimes I've taken my eyes off him again, and I've come back to him. You know what I find happening more and more? I'm becoming more and more aware of situations that I may be in where I'm in danger of not abiding. And what is even more, I'm becoming cautious of those situations. My sensitivity to being in his presence is increasing and heightening. And I would say I'm becoming less likely to be in a position where I'm not abiding. It's something that you learn as you go along. As you mature as a Christian, it's like a child who learns when a child is very young and he's running a lot, when I see my son running sometimes at top speed, my heart comes to my mouth because I know how easy it is for a child to fall. And many times he falls. But I notice now that as he's growing bigger, uh, uh, the, 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 the t it tends to happen less because he's learning that th it can happen. So he's more careful. It's the same thing as we abide in him. You learn the dangers of letting him go and so you learn to let go less. You learn to find peace in the walk. I, I'll use my, my daddy as an example. When he was much younger and he had a full hair of black hair, I still remember it vividly. You know, there were times I saw things happen where he was he would he would become a little anxious. Sometimes he would become flustered, sometimes even worried. As the years have passed, I've noticed a change in him. And today, I can tell you that he's basically unbothered by anything. I've seen him receive some of the most devastating, earth-shattering news. And the emotion that he expresses is almost, almost bordering on nonchalance. And if you ask him, why is it that you can relate to these things in this way? I can tell you what he'll, he'll say immediately. He'll say, I'm a fatalist. For those who are wondering what I'm talking about, a fatalist is a person who believes that no matter what happens, God is in control. As you grow in your Christian walk, you learn how he works and how he operates. And as you learn this, you become more at peace with whatever happens because you know he is in charge. It comes with experience. So you grow in him. As you abide, you also become sanctified. Now, this is something that is particularly relevant to us on this platform this morning. And the reason why I say that is because I believe that God is preparing us for a great task ahead, something that the, the, the Christian church for 2,000 years has not been prepared for. And that is the final representation of Christ on earth. He's sanctifying us. 
all of us who come on here each week and listen, this is a process of sanctification. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Through thy truth. I know many people don't like to hear me talk about, they don't like to hear doctrine mentioned. And there are maybe may some people who think that doctrine is too much a focus for some of us. But I want to point out to you that the people of God are sanctified through truth. As you grow in Christ, you come to learn about him more. And this knowledge helps to enhance your walk and your relationship with him. If I believe that brother Judah is a serial killer or a rapist, do you think my relationship will, will, will be the same with him? Even if it's a misconception. Or if I believe that brother Elton is a child molester. I'm sorry to use you brothers for such graphic examples, but I'm sure you understand. What you believe about a person affects greatly the kind of relationship you have with that person and the way you relate to that person. So don't think that you can believe that God roasts people forever and your walk with him is going to be the same. The people of God, especially those who are being prepared for the final work, must be sanctified. They must come to the place where they understand more and more what their God is like. And that is all doctrine is. Doctrine is the truth about what God is. In fact, Paul says that one of the reasons why the church continues to remain as children is that they are tossed about by every wind of doctrine. In other words, when the church comes to the place where God wants it to be, they will be solidified. It will be solidified in truth. And as I said, I believe that that is taking place in our own personal lives each day, as well as I would like to think when we meet collectively. Sanctification is one of the things that must take place as we abide. And I hope Brother Joel is on and got my answer before he asked the question. Abiding involves learning to obey. Now, sometimes people might think that abiding means you just sit down, fold your arms, smile, and abide. I want to clarify that misconception. When you abide, there are a lot of things that he's going to tell you to do. And you might say to me, well, isn't that work? And I'm going to say to you, it depends. Jesus says to me this morning, go and witness to your neighbor. Because I'm abiding, I hear that voice and I go. Or he says, go into the town and preach to everyone at the top of your voice. Because I'm abiding, I go. Now the thing is, isn't that work? Labor is working in order to gain something from God in return. Bear that in mind. It is doing something because you think that something will elicit a response from him. It is trying to win his favor by your deeds. When you abide and Jesus says, do something, you know what the motive is? It is love. Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my word. When I wash the dishes for my wife, or I, or I, I, I sit down and I spend time and I cut out something out of a piece of paper for my son, I can tell you that it's not labor. I'm doing it out of love and I'm doing it because I know it will bring them joy and pleasure. It's a delight for me to do it for them because the motive in my heart is love. Now, if my wife says to me, wash the dishes or I will divorce you, you know what? Immediately that becomes labor. Immediately it becomes something that is tiresome and a burden. And that is the difference between doing something for Christ and laboring to win the favor of God. Everybody who abides in Christ, he's going to speak to you and he's going to tell you to do things. And you are going to do it because you love him and you have that relationship with him where you want to please him. This is why. Abiding in Christ is not a laborious experience. 
It is an experience of love. So I hope you understand that distinction. I'm not saying abiding means sit down lazily, doing nothing and waiting for Jesus to come again. Not at all. In fact, a Christian probably works 10 times harder than anybody else. Because you know what Paul says? Paul says the love of Christ constrains, compels, forces me voluntarily to do his will. When you abide, it is impossible for you not to work. But that work is an act of love, not labor. The fourth thing that happens when you abide is that you have to fight. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Now, why is it a fight? It is because we are physical beings. Every time I go into town, there are a thousand things that I hear to distract me. Every other female that passes is scantily dressed. Nowadays, there, seem to, there seems to be a problem wearing clothes. Everywhere you turn, there are things to distract you. Social media, music. I mean, it is a fight. So keep your eyes on him in the midst of all these distractions. What Paul says, it's something you have to do. You have to walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Because we as physical beings are so accustomed to the physical, it is a fight to keep your eyes on the spiritual. Not labor, not work. It is a fight because of our own nature and our surroundings. So again, I want to point out that the fight is not labor. The fight is against your own tendencies and your own nature, if you understand what I'm saying. But I want to point out something to you. If at any time you are abiding and you find that it becomes work, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And Jesus himself highlights this. Look at what he says. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. He says, Come unto me, all ye that do what? All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of you who are working, practicing health reform, and mark you, I'm not saying anything is wrong with do any of these things. I, I, I believe in health reform. But if you are doing it to win God's favor, something is wrong. Jesus says, all of you who are working, and why are you heavy laden? It's because the work is not accomplishing anything. It's not getting you anywhere. You are doing all these things and you find that you feel frustrated, exasperated, like you are stuck in one spot. He says, I will give you rest. And that is an interesting phrase because you know what? He never said, come unto me and you will find rest. Or come unto me and rest will come to you. He says, I will give it. There are people who spend their entire lives trying to make millions of dollars because they think that will give them rest. There are people who have everything that a human being could possibly want. They have 20 vehicles and, and 10 houses trying to find rest and they can't find it right now they are trying to find ways to make it possible for humans to live on the moon i've heard some even talk about mars everything you can think of they are trying to do it to find rest it is impossible to find it anywhere but in one place jesus says come unto me and i will give it to you it is his work there is nothing that a man can ever do. And it brings him to the place where he finds rest, except to come to Jesus. If you find that you are struggling and what you're doing is laborious, it is because you have not come to Jesus. Verse 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Here we see again, where when you come to Jesus, it is a process of learning about him. 
It is learning who he is, learning how he operates and how he does things. It is coming to the truth. He says, learn of me. And you know what you're going to learn? He says, I am meek and lowly of heart. I always used to see that phrase in the verse and I wondered, why does it make sense? What is Jesus trying to say? Why does he say, I am meek and lowly of heart? And then it hit me. What Jesus is doing is drawing a contrast between himself and other gods and everybody else. Allah and Brahman and Buddha and all of these false gods. You know what? They are all arrogant and haughty and aloof and demanding and detached and unmerciful. They are watching how you walk, how you eat, how you sleep, how you talk. Every little action that you do, they are waiting with a big stick to condemn you. They demand the hard work before they will accept you. They demand everything you have and maybe it's still not good enough. Jesus says, I am not like that. I am meek and lowly. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't demand anything from you. I am not interested in your hard work and your labor. What I want is you. I want your heart. I want a relationship with you. That is the point he's making. He says, I am meek and lowly. I have no demands to make of you except that you come to me. I am meek and lowly. And if you come, you will find what mankind has been searching for for thousands of years. Rest and peace. If you find that you are working and laboring, it is because you have not come to him. Understanding this has, uh, you know, there's a, there's a passage of scripture that has given me a warm time understanding for a long time. And while I was studying this, I came to a much better understanding of it that I, I want to share it with you this morning. This passage of scripture is found in Matthew chapter 17. For a long time, as I said, this passage gave me a hard time to understand. I, I went to my father about it and we discussed it and deliberated and looked at possible ideas. But we never came to a decisive conclusion. And this week I was in the yard working and talking to the Lord about it. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I think I, I've come to understand what it means. I'm going to read the passage and I'm going to tell you what I used to understand it to mean and I'm going to tell you what I see now. Starting at verse 14 in Matthew, of Matthew chapter 17, it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And here is the part that, give, that, that has given me difficulty to understand now. He says, how be it, this kind goeth not out by prayer and fasting so he's talking about unbelief here and he says this kind of unbelief you cannot get rid of it unless you pray and fast now the understanding that i've always had of this passage and it's still a school of thought that i hear is that all of us have access 
And all of us have the capacity to do certain things, like heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. The reason we are not able to access this ability is because we have our unbelief. And if we can get rid of that unbelief, then all of this will become available. And how do you get rid of the unbelief? It is by praying and fasting. Now, this explanation has never really sat well with me because when I work it out in my mind, logically what it is saying to me is that I am going to have to work to win something from God. He has something waiting to give me, but if I want to access it, I have to work for it. I have to fast and I have to show him that I deserve this before I get it. It never sat well with me and I couldn't understand as i said until recently i share with you what i think the lord showed me now the first thing i want to say to you is that there are also two levels of unbelief there are two levels of unbelief or two types of unbelief the first one is what the atheist and the heathen out there has they don't believe in god at all as far as they are concerned he doesn't exist but for a christian who is abiding there is something else that is classified as unbelief, and I'm going to show that to you. In order to understand this passage better, I want to look at it from the perspective of, I want to look at Mark's version. I'm not going to read it. But when I went and read what happened in Mark chapter 9, it gave me a clearer picture of what really happened on this occasion. I want you to think about this. Jesus gave his disciples power, and he sent them out to heal the sick and work miracles. I believe that Jesus was giving them a taste of what was to come. And in addition to that, he needed attention to come to him. And he was just one person. He had thousands of people to witness to and he could not do it alone. So he gave the disciples this privilege to help to bring people to him. Now when disciples went to heal a blind man, what do you think? gave them the confidence that they could do this. I believe it is because they saw what Jesus did. They knew what he was capable of. Every day they saw him do impossible things. So when James or John or any of them walked up to a blind man and said, be healed, they knew that the person who had given them the authority to do this was capable of it. So their eyes were fixed on what he could do and his abilities. In, in a limited sense, they were abiding in so much as it was possible without the indwelling of the Spirit. They were focused on him and what he could do every time they worked a miracle. But now on this occasion, they come upon something that they have not seen before. I suppose... As they are approaching this demon-possessed boy, there's a crowd of people around. And before they get to the boy, they see people panicking and talking and running around. And they can see the fright and the uncertainty on the faces of people. Because the Bible says that everywhere the demon takes this boy, it says the demon would tear him and rip him. And he would froth at the mouth and gnash at the teeth. This was a very aggressive an extroverted demon and it was doing things with this boy that was unprecedented and not seen by the disciples before i can imagine i mean we know what I, the bible says he was a lunatic you, you can imagine how he was behaving and acting it was the same boy the demon would sometimes throw him into the fire or throw him into the sea so before the disciples got to him they saw the reaction of the people. And you know, what they, you know what happened to them in that moment? They started to look at the situation. They started to look at the situation. So that by the time they got to him, there was already doubt in their minds. Whereas all along they had been focused exclusively on Jesus. Now they started to look at the situation. So when they came to him now, and he started acting out and carrying on, there was doubt and uncertainty in all their hearts. They started commanding him to come out and nothing happened. 
and they commanded again and nothing happened and every time they failed the folk the situation became greater their focus on the situation became greater and their focus on jesus became less until eventually it was impossible for them to cast out that demon so jesus comes and i wanted to notice that the demon does the same thing he tries the same tactic on Jesus. The Bible says as soon as he saw Jesus, he started to tear the boy again, trying to intimidate Jesus. Of course, that was a failure. He cast out the demons and the disciples come to him and ask, him a very important question why couldn't we cast him out jesus says because of your unbelief now i want to ask you a question at this juncture do you think at any point the disciples doubted jesus power i don't think so do you think at any point they doubted his ability to do what needed to be done i don't think so what is it that they did they took their eyes off jesus and looked at the situation instead and jesus refers to this as unbelief for the abiding christian unbelief is not that you don't believe in jesus and you don't believe in his power and his ability you already know all of that unbelief is taking your eyes off jesus and looking at the situation Jesus says to them, this kind of unbelief does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Why? I was very interested to discover that the U.S. Marines, the U.S. Navy, the Chinese Special Forces, the Russian Spetsnaz, all of them today, do you know that all of them use fasting as a military tactic? I said that when they have a special mission for any of these groups to carry out. One of the, the strategies they use is that they put them on monitored fasting. Because they have discovered that when this happens, it, the soldiers are able to focus with laser sharpness on the mission that is at hand they are able to block out every other distraction and focus what is in front of them and they have found that they are far more successful when they fast before they carry out the mission i didn't know that biologically and scientifically it has been proven that when your stomach is empty your mind is able to focus with clarity and sharpness on anything you put it on i didn't know that so jesus gave a scientific and biological and ultimately spiritual strategy two thousand years ago that is a remedy for anybody who starts to look at a situation instead of jesus he says fast and pray why because fasting will help you to look back on jesus and block out the situation i want you to take note of that it is not that when god looks and sees you fasting god says oh he's depriving himself of food so he must he must really want what he's asking for so i'm going to give it that is not what happens at all it's not that you are working to please god by your self-denial no 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 that is no different from flagellating yourself what jesus was saying is that when you are in a situation where the circumstances are overwhelming you and you have lost sight of me there's something you can do to get it back fast and pray and channel your attention back to me that is all he was saying he was not saying work to win god's favor and i'm suggesting to you that anytime you fast it is not to win god's favor god is not impressed and god doesn't need me to deprive myself of food before he will answer me that is not what it is for it is a strategy that is beneficial to me and to you to help us to focus our attention back on him
and that will get rid of the unbelief that set in the unbelief that says this situation is greater than jesus and i was happy to discover that truth now i'm going to cut what i have i had to say short because of the time but i want to share one more story with you and this story is the opposite this story is about somebody who was able to keep their eyes on him regardless of situation we have touched on it time and time again but it never gets old because it's such a fabulous story and i'm talking about the canaanite woman who came to jesus in matthew chapter 15. i'll just run through here from verse 5, verse 22. what jesus is interested in is not necessarily the quantity of our faith he's interested in the quality of our faith here's what i mean it says behold a woman of canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him saying have mercy on me o lord thou son of david my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil now obviously this woman does not know jesus personally because she's a canaanite what i believe happened is that she heard and she listened and she asked questions about jesus she heard all the stories about the things that he was doing what he was capable of she heard about his power but more than that she heard about him and the kind of person that he was so that by the time she came to him she had a very good idea without even meeting the man what kind of person he was and her faith in what she heard was so strong that it surpassed everything else as you will see but jesus answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she cried after us i promise you that this is not what the woman expected when she heard about this man she heard that he was loving merciful kind and compassionate and now the first time she speaks to him the situation says to her this is not going to work i'm not going to get an answer from god the best thing for me is to turn back he's not answering me how many times have we prayed to god and asked him for things and we're not getting an answer even his followers were against her but this woman is outstanding and unusual somehow she's able to focus on jesus despite the circumstances and she tells herself this can't be right i heard that he's loving merciful gracious and kind she blocks out everything else that is happening and she keeps her eyes on jesus by this time if it was the disciples by this time they would have started doubting they would have seen that demon thrashing about and doubt would have set in she keeps her eyes focused on him she comes to him again and she asks for help the situation gets worse jesus says i am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of israel he makes a xenophobic borderline racist statement he says i'm not here for you jamaicans i'm not here for you americans i'm not here for you canadians a borderline racist statement he says i'm only here for jews no it doesn't matter which age or dispensation you live in that is offensive that is enough to gut anybody by this time she should be thinking you know whatever shred of dignity and self-respect and decency i have let me take it and go my way this man is not going to answer me that was the time for her to lap her tail between her legs and go and find another alternative isn't that what we do sometimes sometimes we turn to him and we're not hearing the answer we want we look for other alternatives the situation overwhelms us we take our eyes off him and we go somewhere else not this woman jesus makes a borderline racist statement to her the bible says that she came 
and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. This is the kind of faith that I want to have. This is the kind of single-minded focus on him that I want to have. Even if he seems to be racist, this can't be right. I've heard that he's loving, kind, gracious, and merciful, and I'm going to believe that despite what the situation around me says, she comes and worships him. Now, just when you think the situation couldn't get any worse, it gets to the worst possible condition. It can't get any worse than this. Jesus says, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. He calls her a dog. This is not what she expected from the Son of God at all. This is defying and going against everything that she has ever heard. I imagine the poor woman confused and perplexed and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know what to say because the situation says, God is not going to help you. Find another solution. The situation says, you won't get any help here. You have to help yourself. And somehow against all odds, this woman is able to block out all the negatives around her and keep her eye focused on Jesus, something that not even the disciples were able to do, something that not even Peter was able to do when he was walking on water. And setting her mind is who he is and the kind of person that I've heard he is. He's loving, gracious, merciful, and kind. And I will not take my eyes off him. She humbles herself in the dust. There's no pride and ego. No self. Truth, Lord. The dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. I'm telling you, the Bible doesn't tell us how Jesus looked or his expression or anything like that. But I can, I can imagine it. I can, I, can, I can see the mask disappearing from his face. I can see tears welling up in his eyes. I can see a smile brighter than the sun of his face. I can see every cell of his body beaming with pride and with love and with affection for this woman. No longer the harsh, unwelcoming, disrespectful exterior. Now the beautiful, welcoming face of God that says, I will give you rest if you come to me. He smiles. And I like what he says. He doesn't just say, woman. He says, oh, woman. Which indicates the emotion that he's feeling towards her. He's amazed. He's pleased. He says, great is your faith. And he gives her the desire of her heart in that very moment. I'm going to cut what I have to say short because time is gone. But what I want to stick in your minds is that the kind of faith that God wants from us is the faith that says, no matter what I see happening around me, I will keep my gaze fixed on him. What we tend to do a lot of the times is that we come to him. We have a family member or a loved one who is sick. We come to him and we pray and we are not getting the answer that we want. Fire fails to come down from heaven, as my daddy likes to say, and we turn to matches. We try to find solutions ourselves. And we let go and allow situations to overwhelm us. We allow unbelief to come in and rob us of the blessing that he's waiting to give us. Sometimes he makes us wait like he did with this woman. Sometimes he gives us the appearance that he's not hearing and he's not going to answer because what he wants to do is to exercise this kind of faith, the faith that says, even if the situation seems impossible, I am going to keep my eyes on him and I'm going to trust him. He wants to exercise that faith. But make no mistake, he's hearing and he has full control of the situation at all times. So hold on to him. 
Faith is abiding and keeping your eyes on Jesus despite the situation. This is my encouragement to us this morning. Believe and abide no matter what. I'm going to thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you were blessed by these few thoughts. I'm going to close with prayer. And then I'll say so one more thing and hand over for the next session.